Welcome to the Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, Ghouli, Ricky J. Duarte. Today, my guest host is a fellow queer horror podcaster. Please welcome Michael from We Love Horror. Hello, Ricky. How are you? I'm doing great, Boo. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I'm super excited. Like, we've been uh, talking about it for the last couple weeks now, so I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty stoked. It's true. I'm really happy to have you. Uh, I love your show a lot, uh, and you. it's exciting, too. You've just launched a YouTube channel. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your show and about your YouTube channel? Okay. Um, thank you, by the way, first of all, for the compliment. I really appreciate it. It's always nice when you know people either reach out to me or I talk to people on Instagram and, and they tell me that they like my show because... Yeah, it just it just means a lot because I when I first started the show, I do have a, the it's called the We Love Horror podcast, and it's just a podcast like I try to do it weekly um, when I can, <laughs> but it's just a podcast where I talk about everything and anything horror. And normally, I just have a guest on every week. I try to have different guests on uh, to kind of switch things up a little bit. Uh, most of the sometimes I'll have like recurring guests and stuff like that, but for the most part, I try to do you know different guests every week and. I started out with a co-host when we first started the show and then he quit pretty early on. So it's just a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff. So it means a lot when people say they like my podcast because there were a couple of times, um, you know, when I look back on it where I was thinking about quitting the podcast altogether. So hearing things like that really uh, keeps me going. So thank you. Good. Good. And well, just... it's a, a great show. And I understand how hard it is to be a solo act and uh, you know, finding different interesting co-hosts every week. So yes, you do a great job with it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then as far as my YouTube channel goes, yeah, I just started that last week. So um, I actually decided to kind of, cause I have a tagline when I do my podcast um, as most people that know me from my podcast know, I say, you know, welcome to my podcast where I talk about everything and anything horror. So I decided to kind of take that from my tagline and call my YouTube channel, anything and everything horror. So uh, yeah, that's my YouTube channel. I have only posted two videos so far, so um, I have more videos on the way. So I'm excited. So check I'm me out at anything and everything horror. So I'm excited too. It seems like the response has been really good. You're getting some comments. You're getting some follow, some subscribers. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I mean, so far, so far, so good. So it's it's been really fun. I enjoy it a lot. Good. It's been an inspiration. Like I, God. That's so far in the future for me, YouTube, but um, it's on the horizon, I think, you know? I think you'd be great at it. You have the look for it. You have the voice for it. You oh, just... shucks. I just need a better be back... I need a better background for, <laughs> for I recording. love your background. I was going to tell you before we started recording, I love your background. Oh, thanks. It's My bedroom's all... It's painted black, and it's all just spooky monsters and Ouija boards on the walls. Hey, there you go. I mean, if you're doing like a, I don't know if you're doing a horror YouTube channel or may have oh, plans yeah, it'll, to do that. But... It'll be the Rick oh. or Treat horror Well, cast there you go. YouTube. I mean, you got the background all ready to go. So it's literally the only thing I ever talk about is horror movies <laughs> <laughs> and, and Broadway, I guess. Uh, well, all right. So, Michael, let me know. Was your week a trick or a treat? Sounds like it's a treat getting this YouTube going. It was a little bit of both. Um, yeah. It was a it was a trick at the start of the week, as you know. I I was telling, or I guess last week, um, it was pretty stressful last week for the most part. I won't get into details, but you, I mean, you already know we were talking about it. But I figured that out. So other than that, it's been a treat. So um, I'm on the podcast with you today. This is going to be really fun. I'm really excited. And yeah, oh, I finally watched the menu. So did you love it? I loved it. So yeah. good. I finally watched it for I watched it the other night. I meant to see it in theaters and it just the holiday month got away from me with work and everything. Same. Yeah, it yeah, was the one that I didn't get to see in the theater and I was kind of bummed. 
same. It it's excellent. Oh my god! As like a service industry worker, I felt so seen, <laughs> so, so understood. Seen. Yeah, yeah. It's just very clever. Um, and you know, I love anything eat the rich. So <laughs> yes, and I mean, Anya Taylor Joy is stunning god, as usual. She's just a marvel. Uh, she's it's like she's from another planet she's just she can adapt so well to so many genres but i love that she keeps it like on the dark side right she started in horror she's kind of a lot of her roles are just weird or uh, at least the movies she's in are weird like she's gonna play furiosa in this upcoming mad max prequel so the Charlize theron role she's gonna play her as at a younger age so cool so excited for that she's interesting she's a very interesting uh figure for sure the whole cast is remarkable nicholas holt is he's such a dreamboat i could watch him do anything <laughs> same same um, yeah john leguizamo and ray fines and nobody told me that um oh christ what's her name hold on god damn it i love her she was on who's the boss judith light nobody told oh, me yeah, that yeah. judith light was in this movie she's so good yes <laughs> um yeah, she's like the one, the one celebrity that nobody told me was in it. Anyway, that's a great one for sure. Uh, my week has been, I guess, like you, a trick and a treat. Um, the movie we're talking about showcases the perils of living in New York City. And while it is not a realistic depiction of New York City, it it is a very perilous place to live. A couple nights ago, my upstairs neighbor, neighbor was invaded by a SWAT team at 6 a.m., uh, so I woke up to a battering ram breaking down his door. He's been sketchy as fuck for months. And like, he's back from wherever they took him. And he's back on his bullshit. I can just hear. It's like he's wrestling. 23 hours out of the day. It's just I hear upstairs just like rustling and banging. And uh, it's honestly well, he's not murdering people up there or something. I mean, he is a drug dealer, so I'm assuming it's can I'm assuming it was some weird drug thing. I mean, I, so I live a, a block away from Times Square. Part of the reason that I picked the movie today was that um, so much of it allegedly takes place <laughs> around <laughs> yeah. my neighborhood. Uh, I think we all know that it was not really filmed here and that only about 20, 20, 30 minutes of it take place here. But um Anyway, so, yeah, I live uh, across the street from Port Authority Bus Terminal. So it's just um, a very challenging place to live at times, yeah. for sure, with tourists and vagrants. And um, we don't have ma- uh, hockey masked murderers running around, though, <laughs> unless that's my upstairs neighbor. I mean, anything um, is possible, really. <laughs> but then some, some good news. I uh, found out my writing has been selected uh, or accepted to be a contributing writer to the Rue Morgue uh, magazine website. So I'll be writing for the website coming up pretty soon. I'm very excited. I love that publication. I always have. And it's really cool to be able to see my writing progress. This is the field I would like to, you know, work in and stop waiting tables and, uh, yeah. and you know, contribute to the horror community so yeah you were telling me that i'm so excited for you congratulations on that that's amazing me too thanks it um it's funny i i sent my writing samples probably a week before christmas and i didn't hear back and you know i figured it had just like it wasn't gonna work out and then i got the email a couple days ago saying that they were interested and that they liked the samples so uh we'll see what they assign me but anyway it's it's super exciting uh, it's a step in the direction that i want to head so a great way to start the year super happy for you congrats buddy thanks thanks uh well i love to ask my first time guests what is the root of your horror taste like what is uh, what is the first movie first scary movie that you remember seeing it doesn't even have to be your favorite what when you were a kid what was the first one that you remember um so i remember like My dad grew up on horror as well, and I guess that's kind of where I got my love of horror from, is from him. So, like, my earliest memories are just, like, seeing, like, snippets of things that he'd be watching on TV. Like, whether it would be I'd wake up in the middle of the night and he'd be up late watching a movie or something, and I'd just kind of, you know, see a little scene. Or uh, the first film that I saw, like, actually sat down and saw that my parents allowed me to watch was The Ring. That was the first film they ever like let me actually because it wasn't too I mean, it was scary for me at the time when I was a kid. It terrified me. But 
it's a pretty i mean tame film for the most part you don't see a whole lot i mean it's got a couple of jump scares and some disturbing imagery but i mean aside from like the ending scene which is like super shocking for the you know the time that it came out it was super shocking i remember everybody talking about that but yeah um (laughs) but i think the movie that like really you know catapulted my love of horror and everybody that you know i don't know if your any of your listeners have listened to my podcast at all yet or anything like that but um i won't go on too big of a soapbox because i feel like i talk about this movie quite often on mine but the film that i actually like got me into horror was the grudge i actually saw the 2004 film in theaters when i was wow. like 11 or 12 and um that movie i i've just fell in love with horror ever since that movie and and film in general really like i just i love the art of filmmaking like i love sure. everything about it um so yeah I, I guess that that's what really got me into horror is is those two which is kind of funny because they're both the uh, remakes of japanese <laughs> horror films and they kind of kind of almost have the same concept in a sense but yeah that's really cool how do you are you a fan of the original japanese versions yes um Ringu i would say and what's the grudge called in japanese uh, juan okay yeah i i do i i i prefer the remakes honestly like i love the japanese versions of both but i think the remakes are are better for me i mean and maybe that's just because i saw them first before i watched the japanese ones i bought watched both of the remakes before that so that might also be why but yeah i remember when the recent reboot of the grudge came out (sighs) right before pandemic uh i was bartending at this bar next to nyu so it was a bunch of college kids and they came in and they had just seen it and they didn't know that it was like a reboot of anything they'd never heard of the sarah (laughs) michelle geller version and i it solidified the fact that i'm approaching 40 and um (laughs) yeah oh man it kind of broke my heart a little bit you know yeah that breaks my heart that they you know will never know how good the sarah michelle geller version is but you know uh have you so you watched the menu have you seen any other good horror lately we don't do any spoilers at this point in the show this is just recommendations or things to steer away from that you didn't like um actually no, I haven't I haven't actually had the time to watch anything this past week. Uh just been trying to figure <laughs> trying to figure crap out, so I haven't had much time to watch anything new uh except for the menu. So, sorry I'm so boring coming onto your show today. I'm like, I don't have anything. You're not boring. <laughs> but, but what don't about worry. you? I've watched enough horror for the both of us in the last week. I was sick for a lot of the week, so I stayed home. Uh work is slow, so uh I'm not working as much right now, which is a blessing and a curse you know because i need money but it gave me some time to rest especially after the busy holiday season working in restaurants is a nightmare um yeah i watched okay i'm just gonna start with the big one and i hope i don't lose any listeners from this opinion uh but i fucking hated megan (laughs) oh oh yeah okay yeah i remember you texting me as soon as you got out of that too oh man all right so I, I I knew what this movie was going to be. I wasn't expecting a masterpiece. I wasn't even expecting it to be scary. For me, and here's the thing, everybody's saying, oh, it's a comedy, it's a comedy. I almost feel like the filmmakers didn't intend for it to be as much of a comedy as people are saying that it is. But now that yeah. they're saying it, the filmmakers are just rolling with that. Um, it starts out with a funny gag, you know, and I I kind of... I feel like if it had kept up that pace of humor, it might have worked a little better for me. It's just, I, I wrote a review for it on spoilerfreereviews.com. And I wrote, I think I said, it takes itself too seriously to be funny, but not seriously enough to be scary. And yeah. for me, that really summed it up. Uh, is it a good time? Sure. Um, I think I was never meant to like it. I I don't relate to movies about kids. Uh, and so the the... The themes of parenting in it, I I see them. I understand what they're saying. It doesn't work for me. And I I just didn't think it was all that interesting. Um, (laughs) I, 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 you know, it's like either like make a choice. Yeah. It didn't have anything that brilliant to say about AI or about, you know, um, kind of screen time or uh, technology taking over parenting. It it didn't have anything that mind blowing about it to me. Which kind of shocks me because james wan is the one that wrote it correct uh no it's written by uh um she is a woman of color she's a black woman akila cooper is okay 
uh, James Bond produced it. Oh, that's okay. That's what I was thinking. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know why I said he wrote it, so but she also wrote malignant. Now he, he directed malignant, correct? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. So she's, she's got this, you know, cool track record. A lot of people are saying that this movie is a hit because everybody is tired of elevated horror where every movie is a thesis on grief, like a two and a half hour thesis on grief. And listen, yeah, I love those movies. I want more of them. More fun horror is it's time as well. We've yeah. been through a lot as a world, you know? Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, here's the thing. I love so many bad eighties horror movies, like the one we're talking about today. <laughs> yes. I don't need every movie that comes out today to be, you know, mind blowingly brilliant. Sometimes it's great to just disconnect your brain and sit back and watch something, you know, weird and silly unfold. But it, for me, this just wasn't, I'm not the target audience for this movie. Yeah. And I and like what going back to what you were saying about how, you know, it takes itself too seriously, but not seriously enough. I feel like that's also kind of confusing because I feel like the trailer comes across in certain aspects. It's a very straightforward, serious horror film. Like it's supposed to be like, and yet laughable, moments. right? And yet laughable. Yeah. I, and here's the thing. The dance sequence that's all over the internet right now, that's it. They show the entire dance. I was, I was sitting there waiting for some ridiculous over the top, like long, da- long <laughs> dance scene. And it's literally just what was in the trailer. So oh. that was a little bit of a letdown too. I hear a lot yeah. of audiences are really like going crazy during this movie. My audience was not, no one was that interested or invested. And it was a pretty full house. I went opening night. So, so there's that. Uh, I watched the pale blue eye on Netflix. Uh, it's a murder mm. mystery based on a book starring Christian Bale and Harry, um, oh God, what's his name? He was in Harry Potter. Harry Melling. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. In it. yeah, he played Dudley Dursley. Um, anyway, so Dudley Dursley plays Edgar Allan Poe. And it takes place at West Point, which is where he was a cadet at a military academy when he was younger, before he was a famous writer. So Christian Bale plays this like jaded and distinguished detective and he's sent he's sent to west point uh for a murder mystery this is all historical fiction it didn't really happen um and he meets poe and poe assists him in this murder mystery Mm -hmm. uh jillian anderson is in it she's fucking fabulous the performances in this movie robert duvall who i haven't seen in a movie in 20 years Oh yeah, uh, I was gonna say that. I was like, he hasn't been he hasn't been yeah, around for a while. It was, at least it was a great surprise to see him. Great surprise to see him. Uh performances are solid. They are it's what carried this movie because it's a little over two hours long and it never fully comes together for yeah. me. Uh and from what it seems like for most people on the internet as well. Uh it's beautiful to look at. It takes place in the Hudson Valley, New York, uh at wintertime, so snow everywhere using natural lighting so only candles and fireplaces and you know sunlight it's it's gorgeous to look at i don't i do recommend it um it's just a a patient moviegoer is (laughs) is probably the target demographic uh and as far as harry's performance as edgar Allan poe i almost wish i could see him play this role in a better more interesting movie you know because he's perfect in it he doesn't killer job uh so anyway so that's that and then i've just you know i've been on a vincent price kick watching his old classics twice told tales is one of my favorites a anthology based on the stories of nathaniel hawthorne uh, and it's pretty cool so anyway those are my those are my big recs for the week nice well hey why don't we talk about the movie at hand let's go trick-or-treating yes So today we are talking about Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan. We're talking about this because we're coming back from my winter break, uh, took a couple weeks off from the show. I've been regrouping. I've been re-listening to all of my episodes, my first 13 episodes and my mini-sode, and taking the things that I felt worked and the things that didn't work and just trying to learn lessons and tighten the, you know, tighten things up a little bit. Um, And I've gotten some great feedback from listeners too. So uh, we are back. We are switching my drop date to Fridays rather than Mondays, seeing how that goes. So uh, we're coming back on Friday, the 13th of January. What better movie franchise <laughs> to discuss than that? Now, listeners, I'm going to be perfectly honest. Neither Michael nor myself are the world's biggest Friday, the 13th fans. 
Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which that, I think th- might be why this is my favorite in the series, because it's everybody else's <laughs> least favorite. <laughs> you know what um, I have I, to say? I have to say, Ricky, this movie actually isn't as bad as people say it is. Like, I think people are just upset because... I think they mismarketed this movie. I think this movie should be called, you know, Jason. <laughs> Jason joins the cast of Love Boat or something because it's literally just like them on a boat. Yeah. Jason takes a boat to Manhattan. Jason hardly takes Manhattan at all. No. Right. Um. Yeah. Jason they takes really... Manhattan in the last 20 minutes of the movie. I don't know. They had a great <laughs> opportunity here and we can talk about that for sure. Uh, I do. I want to make it clear. I do appreciate the Friday, the third, the ter- 13th series. Jason as a um, character is iconic. And I, I, I do like as a character, it's just the movies. It's not my favorite franchise. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that I hate it. You know, I, I'll tune in. I'll watch them every once in a while. What I like about this movie is that it takes the setting somewhere else. We're not at Camp Crystal Lake, uh, except for the opening scene. So it does something a little different. I, some of basically the first seven movies, ten parts two through seven, tend to run together for me because they all take place at Crystal Lake, and so it's hard to. And it, I mean, you have the whole Tommy Jarvis uh, saga. You have Tina, yeah. the the telekinetic in in seven. But for the most part, I can't tell them apart. And it, it's just because I, you know, it's not a it's not a series that I now Halloween. I can tell you every movie front to back. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, it's it, and, and, and the Child's Play series. I adore them. Friday the 13th is just not on my <laughs> top list. So um, this movie uh, basically Part seven didn't do as well as they wanted it to. The character of Tina, who had telekinesis, the movie's basically Carrie versus Jason. Yeah. Didn't do as well as they wanted. She was supposed to continue. She was going to be the new Tommy Jarvis. She was going to be Jason's new nemesis. But because the movie didn't perform well, they asked that idea and decided to try something different and take Jason out of Crystal Lake. A producer said, why don't you put him in New York City? And so that was the idea. And they wrote this big, uh, the screenplay is written by Rob Hedden uh, and Victor Miller. Well, Victor Miller created Jason. He wrote the original screenplay. So Rob Hedden wrote and directed this film. He originally wrote this elaborate New York City set. There's going to be a boxing match where Jason and Julius have a boxing match in Madison Square Garden. There was going to be a big elaborate chase on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Jason was going to climb the Statue of Liberty. I think that's how it was supposed to end. Uh, the Empire State Building, they were going to film there. Wow. Um, and of course, Times Square. When he presented this screenplay, he was told, we don't have the budget for any of this. Rewrite it. And we're going to give you two days to film in New York City. <laughs> so <laughs> they use those two days to film the, the really cool Times Square sequence, which is literally only about three minutes, unfortunately. And we'll talk yeah. about that when we get to it. The rest of the movie was filmed in Canada, in Toronto, which is oftentimes used for New York City. Of course, they do look very similar, but uh, the film opens with a, well, we'll talk about the cast. Boy, is there a cast. Jensen Daggett plays Rennie, our final girl. She is, she's kind of the most milk toast final girl I've ever seen. <laughs> she's yeah. just like she seems subdued the entire movie. You know, uh, Kane Hodder is Jason. Kane played Jason in Fridays six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Uh, he has played Jason more than anybody. He really is the iconic. I mean, he's great in all. He's of them. the one that most people I feel like think about when they think about like Jason. Yeah, he. He defines the character. He approach. He's a stuntman who approaches it from a, the role of an actor, and he knows that he utilizes his body movement, knowing that he can't show his face because it's behind a mask. It's very interesting hearing him give converse, uh, give interviews, talking yeah. about what Jason means to him and has his approach to the character. Um, we also have colleen van uh or barbara bingham as colleen van dusen that is rennie's teacher uh we have peter mark richmond a very famous character actor playing charles mcculloch he is rennie's uncle and guardian uh ace plays toby the dog scott reeves is sean uh vincent craig dupree is julius the boxer 
uh saffron henderson is jj my favorite character who dies five minutes into the movie <laughs> uh kelly who as uh ava watanabe she is stunning she in is this movie so good she's probably the best of all of the people who die i agree and then we have charlene martin as tamara uh, tamara mason uh the prom queen mm. so those are the the biggest most notable cast members well all right so it was released on july 28th 1989 it's 100 minutes long. It was uh, made with a budget of five to five and a half million. And in the box office, it brought in 14.3 million. So it made its money back, but it didn't make much. Yeah. This movie came out at the same summer as um, Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, Nightmare on Elm Street 5. It was up against, so it was up against these two movies. As well. it, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, maybe part, yes, part five. So it was up yeah. against other movies that were destined to do much, you know, yeah, pretty well as well. It's an interesting time in horror history when we've got the three main slashers competing in a box office together. And unfortunately Jason lost big time. I'm certain Freddie probably won because I don't think revenge of Michael Myers did very well at all. No, no (laughs) critically or financially. (laughs) No, not at all. You know what? I said Toronto, the film uh, was, it was filmed in Vancouver. My bad. Please don't be mad at me. Uh, they used a bunch of the I Heart New York logos, but replaced the heart with Jason slashing through with a knife. And the New York Tourist um, Association, Tourism Association, nixed that. They were like, stop it. You're scaring our tourists. We don't want it. So they had to completely rethink the um, the ad campaign for it, which I think which is kind funny. of a bummer because that's actually really cool. It's a I much better poster. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. a much better poster. Uh, and it it was really not well received by audiences or critics. Again, critiquing the fact that most of it takes place on a boat and very little of it takes place actually in New York. Uh, and then the implication of humor came off as weak, uh, terrible plots and just the effect, you know, they didn't deliver on the promise of Jason taking Manhattan. So why don't we get a little bit into the plot? It opens with the best song of any horror movies in the 80s, Darkest Side of the Night by, I think it's by Metropolis. The song was written for the movie by the guy who wrote the score. Uh, it's kind of a kick-ass song. It's a little I bit think of a so, too. I was going to actually mention that. Yeah, it's so good. And it's a montage of um, places in New York City. Actually, there's an opening monologue by maybe like a radio host, perhaps. But he's got a very New York attitude when he talks, you know? Yeah. Uh, And we're panning over the city. And then Times Square, and we get the title card, Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. And yeah, it's the DJ at WGAZ. And it says, it's like this. We live in claustrophobia, a land of steel and concrete trapped by dark waters. There is no escape, nor do we want it. We've come to thrive on it and each other. You can't get the adrenaline pumping without the terror, good people. I love this town. We love New York. (laughs) Instantly. Instantly, we are like thrust into some kind of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles looking version of New York City. Yes. Uh, we are shown images of places that the, the story is going to go a little bit later, right? So Times Square, you've got these punks hanging out in Times Square, smoking cigarettes and listening to music. Yep. Um, a dark alley. We see some, a couple junkies shooting up green drugs in this alley. Yeah, there's a close up of like an old barrel full of green sludge and there's a rat swimming around in it. There's a clip of a diner, people eating in a diner, uh, elevator down to the an escalator down to the subway. There is a clip of people on us on a subway train that looks nothing like any subway train in New York City. (laughs) Did they actually Um, film any of the subway stuff in New York City or did they film that in Canada as well? Uh, that was that would have been in Canada or part. Of, they filmed a little bit in L.A. also. So maybe mm. um, but that's definitely a set. 
Yeah, I was going to sure. say, because I was like, that would have been kind of cool if they actually filmed on the actual subway, but... Well, they didn't. The only <laughs> the only filming actually in New York is in Times Square. Everything all, else is on... Everything else is a else. set and in Vancouver, yeah. Damn. So after all of that, we get into the beginning of the movie. So the movie starts out on basically a, a floating fuck pad. Uh, it's like <laughs> yeah. this pretty cool looking boat. Jim and Susie are these you know, hot, mindless teenagers who are having a romantic night and they're on Camp Crystal Lake. You can see the campground in the background. They're yeah. making out and Jim decides it's a good idea to tell Susie the legend of Jason Voorhees and how he drowned in these waters while some camp counselors were having sex and not paying attention to him. <laughs> and now he kills campers every summer. While he's telling this, we see underwater Jason is chained uh, underneath a dock at the end of number seven, he gets trapped underwater. He uh, he gets pulled down by Tina's dead father. <laughs> it's it's insane. What what I do appreciate about the series is that they do carry on from what happened before. Yeah, even you know what I mean. Yeah, they. It's they a, at it's least... at least a direct continuation from that, even though they scrapped the idea that they were originally going to go with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think six and seven, he gets trapped down at the bottom of the lake. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Uh, But there happens to be like a giant electrical cable underwater for some reason. (laughs) Well, and I love how the anchor is just like moving as if it's like, like not like it doesn't weigh like a bazillion pounds and would not fucking move the way that it's moving. (laughs) Dragging along the bottom. And honestly, it's kind of a small looking anchor for such a big boat right yeah i know i thought so too it happens to catch on this electrical cable that has no business being underwater at the bottom (laughs) of camp crystal lake which is also dragged across the top of jason's body so it 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 jiggles the cable and electricity starts flowing from the cable into jason reviving him because that's pretty much how he's brought to life a couple of times in the series yeah I will say uh, it was kind of a cool effect, though, to see, like, because you get that shot of the boat and then you get, like, the glowing light from under the water. That was kind of a cool looking effect that they did. And I also wanted to mention, I thought it was kind of funny when he's telling her the story of Jason, the kid that's, like, drowning in the water looks completely normal in that scene, like, doesn't, isn't deformed, nothing. And then the rest of the movie, all of a sudden, he has, like, these deformed. I was like, I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> well, <laughs> In every iteration, Jason is born disfigured, right? Like, right, yeah. In this one, he start. We see little Jason multiple times throughout this movie. He starts out being not not disfigured, and then every time you see him, he's a little bit more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, so it does kind of screw up uh, the continuity there. Yeah. Uh, but so. Uh, Jason is Jason is alive. Jason woke up and we see him start to climb up on the boat. Jim goes to check the anchor or something. He he leaves yeah. Susie behind. And when he when she gets up to go look for him, a hockey masked figure jumps around the corner and stabs her with a knife, but it turns out to be a play knife where the blade a retractable blade and Jim starts laughing and takes off the mask. Susie doesn't think it's very funny. But she goes to the bedroom to fuck him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yep. While they're making out, Jason sneaks up behind. Uh, Susie screams and climbs out the window. Jim is still behind and he gets harpooned uh, in the gut with like this giant harpoon. And he he serves us one of the worst death scenes I've ever <laughs> seen. Which is such a bummer because he's a really beautiful person. Such a babe, such a bad actor. Um, I have to say, I mean, in all the Friday the 13th movies, I think this has like the best looking cast of people. Like everybody in this movie, I'm like, damn, you are so good looking. Like there's so many good looking people in this movie. I was like, wow. Agreed. We'll get to him. But the nerd in this movie who's supposed to not be hot. He is so hot. I was going to say that. He looks like a hipster from Brooklyn. Like he is, he is the like quintessential, like he walked so Harry Styles could run. Basically. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. So Jim is dead. Susie's running on the deck of the ship. She falls down some hatch and 
we see Jason step over the hatch. It's like an upward shot. There is DVD footage of him doing this with a strap on <laughs> as a joke. <laughs> um, and it's, it's pretty hilarious, but anyway, he doesn't have a strap on in the movie. So he is <laughs> looming over Susie and he's got this long spear. Like you would shoot out of a, like uh, a harpoon gun, harpoon kind of thing. gun. Yeah. yeah. Um, Susie lets out the most ridiculous screams you've ever heard in your She's entire like, life. No, no, no. But it's like it's like high pitched, like squealing, like it. Yeah. Anyway, she gets it. He stabs her in the chest, and that's the end of Susie. So it's the next morning, and yeah. we see a a really huge boat, like massive. Yeah. And there's a graduating class taking their senior trip. Here's the dumb thing about this. In no previous film did it show Camp Crystal Lake connected to another body of water. Yeah. Right? Suddenly, Camp Crystal Lake is attached to a river that leads to, to the, the ocean. Hudson, to the ocean, to yeah. New York. What? <laughs> Uh, so it's it's commonly known that Crystal Lake, that the, the Friday the 13th, 13th movies take place in New Jersey. So that's all fine and well. But like Camp Crystal Lake is not connected to any sort of body of water. No. Whatever. We're going with it. They needed plot convenience. So, you know, they sure, <laughs> they're just they like, end. it's fine. It, it doesn't make any sense, but just don't question it. It's cool. Don't ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> so we meet Rennie, who is our boring AF <laughs> final girl. You know, I hate saying things like this sometimes She's because I'm like always afraid. Julie James. Oh no, you're right. Yeah, listen, Julie James gets a lot of shit, but maybe it's just because I love Jennifer Love Hewitt when I was younger. I never looked at her as a bad final girl until I was an adult. Yeah, no, I I do love I love Jennifer Love Hewitt as well, but she ain't no freaking fine. <laughs> I mean, she's a little bit better in the second film, but like even so, I'm just like, ugh, you are yeah. boring. Yeah, but and this she is definitely the Jennifer Love Hewitt of <laughs> this film. So she's being uh, she's being brought to the senior class trip by her English teacher, uh, Colleen Van Dusen, and. Mrs. Van Dusen gives her a gift, a graduation present. And to anybody who's listening, who wants to win my heart or woo me in any way, get me the gift that she gives Remy. She gives her a pen that was once used by Stephen King. And she says, you're going to write great things with this pen. Noted. I'll get that for you. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, but like, okay. Remy's a writer. Is she a horror writer? We don't know, but we you never know. find out anything about her except her aquaphobia, which is just okay. Like that's yeah. all we learn about her. She's there's nothing, there's no you know distinguishing characteristics about her. She just sees visions, and that's about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're quickly introduced to an array of teenagers, but uh, before that, Remy or Renny uh, runs into her uncle who is also Ugh. her guardian, who is also the biology teacher. He does not want her to be there. He's overprotective. He's abusive. He's the worst. Honestly. <laughs> uh, so his name is uh, Dr. Charles McCulloch. Uh, and he says she's not ready. She shouldn't be on this trip. He doesn't want her out. And Rennie says, listen, I'm doing this. I have to. I have to get over my fear of water. And yeah. you can't stop me. I feel really bad for him being in this movie because he had a distinguished career and I don't, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know if he really wanted to do this movie or not. He's committed as hell to the role though. Oh yeah. Yeah. He makes you hate him from beginning yeah. to end because I, there's nothing, there's nothing. I think the worst thing about this movie is that he <laughs> has, that he's pretty much in the entire movie. Right. Yeah. He makes it <laughs> way too long in this movie. Uh, Tamara and Ava are two popular girls. Uh, Julius is this really cocky boxer. He's he's cool though. Like he's cocky, yeah. but he's cool. Uh, there's another unnamed boxer. <laughs> uh, we have JJ, who is this really cool punk girl in a leather jacket, and she plays this pink electric guitar. She's pretty fucking rad. It's a pretty cool guitar too. Yeah. We have Wayne who is a nerd with a video camera, uh, like very AV, uh, AV club, but like a nerd by maybe 1989 standards. 
but very much Brooklyn hipster by today's standards. Uh, it, I just think it's funny that that look is now considered cool. Quote, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think those are the main teenagers. Uh, so we see on the ship, there's like a big boiler room looking area. They've got a giant round light up dance floor in like a party room with decorations. Uh, they're all dancing and having fun. Rennie is not having fun. <laughs> Rennie, <laughs> Rennie stays to herself with a sourpuss face the entire movie. But this cute boy who has a crush on her. He's the uh, captain's son, right? Yeah. So Sean, the captain's son, gives Rennie a uh, necklace with the Statue of Liberty on it. It. This is no heart of the ocean. This is a cheap no, as fuck. <laughs> cheap as fuck looking piece of bad plastic <laughs> painted gold jewelry <laughs> yeah it probably uh, put, if she put it on it'd probably turn her skin like green it's as green as the statue of liberty yes he says you know there's a there's this 22 story statue in new york i'd love to take you to the top of it uh and so she's charmed by this or whatever i mean he is cute He's attractive. He's very Uh, attractive. He came in two weeks before. Like he was a replacement. The original actor whose name I can't remember got fired when they realized he couldn't act. Um, I've seen footage of his acting and it's, I mean, it's even by Friday the 13th standards. He's not good. Oh, that's sad. Cause cause the Friday the 13th franchise, I don't know if it's always been known for good acting in general. So that's no, they're not. If you're even worse than that, that's, that's sad. (laughs) Agreed. Uh, Sean is the son of the captain of the ship. There's this awkward moment where his dad's like, I'm handing over the steering wheel. I don't know what it's. Is it a mast to you? Is it a mast? The helm or something? The helm. Yeah. The mast is a, I don't know. (laughs) The mast is the thing on, on the, yeah, with the clock or, you know. I grew up in Arizona. We don't have water there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's really awkward because he doesn't know what to do. And you get this impression of like, I want to be my own person. I don't need you to tell me what to do, dad. And then the dad feels <laughs> feels bad about it. JJ and Wayne are hanging out talking. So the punk and the nerd. Uh, and Wayne's like, I got a crush on Tamara. JJ says, she doesn't like you. She's trying to use you. But meet me downstairs in this weird boiler room because there's great <laughs> acoustics. And I'm going to jam on my guitar. Yeah. So she goes... She goes down there and like, she's so likable. She's just this cool, like musician. Uh, I do think it's funny that she's just been jamming on her guitar on the deck of the ship. Like it's something that everybody wants to listen to. (laughs) Well, I I love how we get that weird, like minute and a half long, almost music video segment of her just like on the top of the ship, like jamming out. And it's like from the perspective of his his camera (laughs) as he's just filming her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she sounds some... great, though. She's really sounds good. Great. Yeah, she's trying to get some rad music video footage, yeah. uh, which is why she wants him to film her in this boiler room. So she goes down there and she's jamming out. We have seen Jason climb aboard, like kind of, I think, whatever the anchor rope. So we know he's on the ship and he comes up behind her and she screams and drops her guitar and she runs. And she, uh, it's just such a cool pink guitar. It's on the T-shirt I'm wearing right now. So uh dope. Uh, she runs down some stairs. There's no possible way that he could get in front of her, but somehow he teleports a lot in this movie. There's another scene when we get to it that I was like, what is happening here? What the fuck? (laughs) Yeah. Suddenly he's in front of her and he, uh, it's a camera view of looking at him and he smashes the screen with the guitar, a blood splatter and poor JJ is dead. Which I have to say, like, it's kind of like, it kind of sucks with this movie. The, the only other thing I feel like is kind of a bummer with this movie is that you kill off all the likable characters and then you're yeah. stuck with all these really unlikable characters like the freaking uncle character. He's oh unbearable. I can't stand him. And then you get him like most of the movie and then, you know, people <laughs> people that you actually like get killed off pretty early on and you're like, OK, well, now I'm stuck with these characters. So this is not fun. <laughs> it's true. And I can't tell if they're unlikable because of the writing or because of the people who are playing them. <laughs> could be both (laughs) maybe both yeah so the ship has set sail night has fallen tamara and ava are checking out one of the crew members of the ship and 
Tamara says, oh, it's time for some recreational activities. And uh, they go down downstairs into the ship and she pulls out cocaine from her purse and starts cutting it up on a mirror. And Ava says, I don't want to lose my scholarship. And Tamara says, I'm the prom queen. Do you think I ever get caught? Which is a real exercise <laughs> in white fucking privilege. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, right before they do it, Remy, Rennie, I keep calling her Remy, Rennie walks up and says, have you seen my dog? Oh, by the way, Rennie brought her fucking dog, Toby, uh, on this senior trip. Yeah. And they say, no, we haven't seen your dog. Um, shit, you caught us. Do you want to try some drugs? And Rennie gives him this very, very judgmental look. I mean, very. And she says, no, I don't do that. <laughs> and walks away. Is this the part where they push her in the water, the one girl? Not yet. Oh, okay. Not quite yet. They then get caught by the... Creepy uncle. S- the science teacher. Yeah, yeah, the biology teacher the slash uncle slash Rennie's guardian, uh, Mr. McCulloch, who says, are you girls taking drugs? I'll find out if you're doing anything bad. And they say, of course not. Blah, 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 blah. And they get away with it. We have seen them looking, watching Julius in a boxing match and kicking this guy's ass. <laughs> And it's very clear that Tamara is super into him and finds him very hunky. All right. So Rennie uh, finds her dog and is talking to uh, Miss Van Dusen, the English teacher. And uh, you know, Miss Van Dusen's like, are you having fun? And Rennie just doesn't smile and says, yes, she's so <laughs> fucking like, why did you come? Why are you here? Uh, she's like she the says, definition of like an apathetic like oh my life sucks poor me yeah like, she's just oh. like she's she's daria without the wit seriously <laughs> um, and she's dressed she's dressed like she's in an amy grant music video like i look at her outfit and all i can picture is the baby baby music video baby, baby. you yeah. know where she's got on the stupid hat and like a, a vest over <laughs> it's just it's terrible uh, terrible why are you doing this I will say, like, I do like her hair, though. She's got, like, She's nice... She's got gorgeous curly hair. Voluminous. Yeah. Volu- yeah. Yeah, I love it. Pulled back with, like, a weird barrette. <laughs> yeah. I do love that song, Baby Baby, by the way. It is a uh-huh. good song. <laughs> Tamara, is, she thinks that Rennie is going to tell on her. And so Tamara acts quote, accidentally shoves her into the water. I mean, Rennie, it's like a two-story fall off of this boat. She falls into the water. uh, And she doesn't know how to swim. And she actually sees little child Jason pulling her down by her feet. She's hallucinated him before. She's seen him outside of her port window. She's got this weird connection to Jason. Which uh, I didn't understand because it's been so many years since I've seen this movie. So I was like, why is she like, why does she keep seeing that? And then it like, you know, when we get to it. But yeah. I, at first, I think I was a little confused because I was like, why is she? <laughs> I was like, first of all, why do we have so many psychic people in this franchise? Like, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. They, take, just... they go in that direction for sure. Yeah. No, uh, Miss Van Dusen uh, throws a life, like a little life preserver down there who saves her is it sean does sean jump in yeah he does yeah yeah all right so sean our hero jumps in to help her and save her Uh, of course this is very traumatic for her meanwhile the boxer who lost to julius is in the sauna with a towel over he's laying down on his back he's got a towel over his his nether region his (laughs) nether region he's got a towel (laughs) over his face and he's just relaxing in the sauna he hears the door open and he thinks it's Julius. He says, hey, why don't we check out, why don't we catch up with those babes later? And Jason picks up one of the hot sauna rocks that you pour water over, right? He picks up the hot sauna rock and he jams it into this guy's stomach and it, his stomach catches on fire for some reason, briefly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's a pretty gruesome way to die. And then when we get a further away view of it the rock is shoved into his chest so yeah another... it's like way up here i want to take a moment and talk about how jason looks in this movie i think it as far as like his his costume uh and his mask go i i actually love the way that he looks in this movie he's I drippy agree. and slimy the entire movie which must have been really awful and uncomfortable for kane hotter yeah he also 
this is going to sound weird, his physique, like it shows off his muscles really well. It's a form fitting way that makes him look really strong. It's not yeah. baggy at all. And uh, it, it, for some reason, it sh- it really showcases how fucking tall he is. Yeah. Uh, and how, how big and, and strong Jason is as well. The mask looks really good. It It's the movie, I think it might be the first movie where you don't see his eyes behind the mask. Yeah. There are maybe a couple shots where now that it's been remastered, you can see his eyes. But it, other than that, they're in shadow the entire movie. The way um, they lit it was nice because like, I like it when you can't see the eyes. I just feel like it kind of takes away the fear of like with Halloween, for example, in H2O, when you see his eyes. Yeah, it's just it doesn't make it scary. <laughs> Agreed. It's not as effective. Yeah, because you, you see a person behind the mask. Exactly. Yeah, um, this movie does. I, I love this movie uses color and colored lighting in a really cool way that the other movies don't. I think another reason that I like it so much, it just looks so different. I can differentiate it, this movie from the others. Very, it's a very, very like in quality. I feel like it's a very nice looking movie. Like the like, I think that's why I enjoyed this movie is because it was very you know appealing to look at. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Not only were, not only was the you know the camera work and stuff really good, but like the the people in the movie are also very attractive. So it's just a very attractive movie overall. Like I I enjoy it. I enjoy the way it looks. Me too. It. I think I also really loved this movie when I was younger and I could admit now as an adult, it's not a great movie, but I still it has a special <laughs> place in my heart. This movie, Jason takes Manhattan and Muppets take Manhattan were really big inspirations for me as a kid to move to New York. If Miss Piggy could make it in New York, so could I. And now I live here. My dreams have come true as my upstairs neighbor gets arrested <laughs> and I've got people smoking crack on my doorstep every day. I really need to move out of this neighborhood. <laughs> you know what? You're doing great though. You're doing um, great things for yourself. I'm doing my best. <laughs> All right. So the boxer is dead. We have Tamara uh, with this scheme to entrap Mr. McCulloch in a sex scandal. Do We don't find out why, do we? No, I don't think so she tells him come by my room for my biology final and he's weird about it he says okay fine when he gets there she is in a robe and she pours champagne for both of them and he says no we can't do this and then she says but what about my final and she takes her robe off and she has painted uh like body organs all over she's wearing a bra and like sexy underwear yeah and she's painted like her esophagus and a heart and then like down to her tummy and there's little arrows pointing down 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 to like intestines pointed on and then an arrow pointing down to her hoo-ha and (laughs) he said his reaction is cartoonish he says no i mean no no we can't do this and uh, he threatens to have her expelled and he pushes her away and then we see wayne with his camera come out of the closet and he's captured the whole thing and she says something to the effect of i'm not getting expelled for anything so i i don't i don't understand why she's done this except to be a brat i don't know maybe she (laughs) it may be that she still thinks that rennie told on her for the cocaine and so this is collateral for that that like, could oh, be it. Yeah. You know what? Because he caught them doing it. And he had said That's something right. to the effect of, yeah, if you guys are doing something wrong, I'll find out. That's right. Yeah. That makes we're more gonna, sense then. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go with that. So McCulloch leaves and Wayne decides to open up his heart to Tamara. And he tells her, you know, God, I just, I think you're so beautiful. I've had a thing for you for so long. And she is not interested. And she lets him down gently, but also she's kind of bitchy about it because she's the original mean girl. Yes. And um, Wayne leaves with the champagne, by the way, takes a sip and he says, God, Wayne, you're such an asshole and walks off. Uh, She jumps in the shower, disrobes and jumps into the shower. And when she gets out, of course we have the obligatory naked girl showering scene in a slasher movie. Of course she gets out and looks in the mirror and Jason is behind her. And he, uh, it's, her acting's pretty good here. Yeah. It's a, it's a good little, little moment for her. He shatters the mirror. Does he, he slams her head into it, right? Yeah. Cause she goes to, she gets out of the shower and I think she goes to actually open like the door to the bathroom and she sees Jason walk in. So then she shuts the door again and then he like 
breaks through the door with his hand and grabs her. And then I think that's like when he throws her against the mirror. Throws her against the mirror. It shatters. She falls on the floor. He yeah. rummages around for that, that perfect piece of broken mirror glass. <laughs> and course. he finds it. And he turns to her and he kills her. Damn. She never stood a chance. Never stood a chance. Nope. Meanwhile, Wayne finds himself. He's looking for JJ down below what to like drown his sorrows with her and finally see that she has a crush on him like she's his second choice (laughs) so he's got his camera he's down in this boiler room you know area very nightmare on elm street uh there's steam blowing all over the place he gets hit with some steam and it it knocks his glasses off he's got these thick hipster glasses so now he can't see shit and uh, he's walking, walking, and he sees a figure jump in front of him. He has come across her dead body. That's it. That's it. He finds JJ's dead body. Yep. Uh, with the bloody guitar next to her, so he's scared. His and her like, a... she's got like a really gnarly looking uh, gash into her head. Like he with basically... a really bad wig. Like if it was not her yeah. real hair, it might have been a wig before. But this is like a bad wig on, on her. You know, bloody and and gashed and and everything so he's scared he's still videotaping uh loses his glasses he can't see and he sees someone like walk jump in front of him and where did he get a gun that's what i want to know he has a gun fuck why does he have a gun (laughs) all right well for some reason he's got a gun and he shoots the guy and uh gets closer and realizes it is the like a random deckhand the one that the girls were checking out earlier yeah and then he sees jason and he drops his camera and he starts running and only gets so far because he gets picked up and thrown into like an electrical circuit, circuit board thing. yeah yeah and he bursts into flames and dies obviously <laughs> Now, Ava stumbles upon Tamara's body and screams. And there's a really like this is probably the best chase scene in the movie, right? Oh, yeah. She's running, running, running downstairs. He's right behind her. And then she runs into the dance room with the circular light up dance floor. And it's a silly scene, but it's a cool scene because yeah. he she gets in the middle and she starts spinning around on this dance floor like <laughs> screaming holding the sides of her face and then jason busts through the double doors and then it's like he teleports from one side of the room to the other she sees him over here yeah. and then she looks over and she sees him over here and then over here uh and the, the dance music's playing he comes up on the dance floor and he grabs her by the throat and lifts her up and strangles her it's a great death and then his like when he throws her body down, it's just this really like vicious, hateful, it's good thud. throw. Yeah, yeah, a thud. It, it's it's pretty effective. It's a silly scene, but a really cool kill. When I thought when I first I actually watched it back a second time because I thought maybe like for some reason the reason why she thought he was in front of her is maybe she saw him in a mirror or something. And I was like, maybe she saw his reflection and that's what it was supposed to be. Like, oh, she was confused because she's like, is it a reflection or is he really there? But I was like, no, he's like (laughs) literally teleporting around the room. I don't understand. She did do cocaine earlier, but I feel like that was hours before. I feel like it was hours before, right? Yeah. Anyway, Ava's dead. (laughs) Uh, Wayne's body on the uh, falling on the electrical board for some reason causes the ship to take on water. Maybe it just like exploded something in the bottom of the ship and it, now it's flooding. I guess. So Rennie has seen more visions of Jason. He like appears through a mirror and reaches out to her. It's a silly looking effect, but I kind of love it. Yeah. Uh, and again, so this is young Jason and his face is disfigured a little more every time that she sees him. Uh, meanwhile, Jason kills the ship captain and his first mate. So in this movie, uh, in movies past, in Friday the 13th past, they, the MPAA sent the movie back and said, you have to cut, you have to cut, you have to cut. This movie specifically wanted to skip that. And so they actually made a lot of the deaths less violent. Yeah. So in this one, the first mate gets strangled, but you see it through a windshield that's like frosted. You can't really see very well what's happening yeah the captain does get his throat slit which by the way by the wrong end of the machete did you notice that (laughs) yes i did (laughs) it's not the sharp side of his machete 
<laughs> it's the dull side. It's like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, it's kind of a slow motion moment. It, It's kind of sad. Uh, this movie does a lot of down angles looking up at Jason, which makes him look bigger, which is pretty Very cool. menacing, I, yeah. Yeah, it's effective. That's fine. So I think we're to the part where they get to the, uh, where Rennie and all them, they get up to like the captain's yeah. bridge or whatever. All right, so we have Sean discover his father's dead body, right? Everyone's caught on that there's a murderer on board. They're assuming that it's Jason. There was a deckhand uh, who's basically the Crazy Ralph character of this movie. Crazy Ralph from yes. Friday's part one and part two, who's like, you kids are going to die out there. This place is cursed. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so this deckhand is taking that over, basically. And so Mr. McCullough says, it must be the crazy deckhand. <laughs> Um, he's trying to take charge of this whole situation, but he has no authority whatsoever. He's not, he's not a leader, you know, he's a pervert and, yeah. And, uh, and a child abuser. So he, he, he says, we need to find that guy. You know, the, tra- the radio transmitter is broken. They're taking on water. All of this is happening at once. And they said, we've got to find Jason. McCullough is convinced that Jason doesn't exist. Uh, at a point, Julius gets thrown overboard. Uh, they find the deckhand, the crazy deckhand, and he's got an axe in his back. And then Jason follows, and uh, shit, shit starts getting real. It turns into James Cameron's Titanic right here, because there's water flooding everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> People are escaping into lifeboats. and You're so right. So And Jason has thrown Julius off the ship. Uh, they lower themselves in a lifeboat. They've got Toby, the dog. Thank God. Yes. Uh, and they get off the ship and a figure jumps up onto the boat, a little reminiscent to the end of the first Friday. Right. Which by the way, yeah. that jump scare at the end of that movie, when I was a kid is one of like the top three jump scares of my entire life. That traumatized you. The exorcist three. Have you seen the exorcist? Thing? Yeah. That fucking yeah. hallway scene with the guy with the scissor thing. No, no, yep. Uh, probably the two biggest jump scares of my childhood. <laughs> You're like, no, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, and I also love how they like kind of um, <laughs> they kind of make like a really quick explanation as to what happened to everybody else on the ship. They're like, where's everybody else? And he's like, oh, that room's gone or whatever. The big, the one room, it's like full of water or something. So it's assumed that everyone else on the boat drown, I guess. Yeah, well, when they're getting on the boat at the beginning of the movie, you see like 20 something people on the ship. Yeah. But then we only literally ever see these characters for the rest of the movie. Yep. So, so it's that's just a very explain, backhanded yeah. like ex- explanation of what happened to everyone else. Oh, yeah, they're in that room, but now it's no longer a room. It's underwater. So everybody drowned. Water. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this figure that jumps onto the lifeboat uh, and scares everybody turns out to be Julius. He survived when Jason threw him overboard. So thank God he's there. They row, row, row their boat through the fog. And they come across the city. Like, yeah. I'm sure there are some kinds of docks around. Yeah, I guess there are. If I think of like the piers along the Hudson. Anyway, it seems like they pull themselves up to like the seaport area. Yeah. Uh, way at the bottom of the island. <laughs> Julius. Julius sings New York, New York pretty poorly as they do this. They dock. They get off the boat. And Mr. McCulloch tells sean like what a terrible place that you docked at this of all the places of all the places in new york city that you could have brought this boat you brought it here he is such an asshole oh i hate him i hate him uh they decide they need to find the police good idea guys and they run off jason climbs up on the dock and it's a stupid stupid silly moment where he looks at a billboard and it's a hockey mask that looks just like his and then he turns around and looks at the camera and it's this double take of like, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be like, we're, <laughs> we're making fun of ourselves, guys. Yeah, it's, it's real silly. So we finally made it to New York City after all Woo! this time. Literally like an hour and 10 minutes into the movie. And they finally make it to Manhattan. Right. To be taken by Jason. <laughs> it's absurd to me. Which, what's, what a coincidence, because we're an hour and 10 minutes into this episode. Oh, shit. Look at you. I just saw that when you said that. I was like, oh, wow. (laughs) Uh, They, um, we start, so the rest of the movie is going to show all of the establishing shots from the opening credits. 
is where the rest of the movie is going to take place. They decide we're going to look for the police. And then these two junkies who we saw in the opening credits approach them. They've got a gun and they kidnap Rennie. And this scene gets real uncomfortable. They, um, they shoot at the dog, Toby, and the dog runs away. Yeah. Right. It gets real uncomfortable. These, the Friday, the 13th movies don't showcase sexual assault, but this one, for some reason chose to go there. They actually shoot her up with this green glowy drugs that they've been shooting up and it shows it and it's really uncomfortable. And the scene takes way too long where he lays on top of her and he's like, Oh, we're going to have a date. You like to party girl. And it's just gross. And out of nowhere, unnecessary. She's fucked up on whatever fake drug they made up for this movie. And then Jason comes up behind him and grabs the needle and shoves it into his back and it comes out his chest. Doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> no. Uh, and he's down. He falls on top of Rennie. Meanwhile, the second junkie approaches Jason. He's got a gun and starts shooting at him, which he shoots six rounds. I shot him six times. I shot him six times. <laughs> and obviously runs out. Jason grabs him and slams his head into a steam pipe. And so I'm not sure how that kills him, but you know, that's fine. Um, blunt force trauma, I guess. But yeah, you know what? Maybe he survived. Why don't we say this? It, it knocked him out. He survived, and it inspired it... him to turn his life around. There we go. Yeah, and he's now an outreach counselor for <laughs> for the city for of New York. Substance users living on the street. He goes and helps other people. Yeah, there we go. With silver lining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. We'll take something. Bad. He became we'll a self help take... author. We'll take something good out of this really unnecessary gross scene in the middle of this movie so they've all split up looking for rennie so julius comes across jason on a rooftop don't know how they got there and julius is a boxer right so he starts throwing punches at jason and jason's taking them one by one like a champ taking them like a champ and he throws a couple dozen punches and he's tiring himself out. Jason's letting him just exhaust himself. He's taking every hit. Kane Hodder says that he was letting Julius actually hit him. I don't know if I believe that because the actor hitting that hockey mask repeatedly with bare knuckles seems silly to me. Yeah. Julius gets exhausted. He can't breathe anymore. He can't move. He's worn himself out, which is a boxing tactic, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, like they will you- let their opponent exhaust themselves and then they'll go in hard. This scene was the one that was supposed to take place in Madison Square Garden. It would have been really fucking cool. Really cool to see this in the garden with or without an audience around them. I think it would have been cool with a with a crowd, right, Jason? I for agree. some reason, somehow they end up in the middle of a boxing ring for some <laughs> stupid reason. Unfortunately, it doesn't ha- happen. Julius t- looks at Jason and says, oh, take take your best shot, man. He's He's beat. And Jason does. And with one hit punches his head off and it flies off the roof and rolls down the building and lands in a trash can. (laughs) And that's the end of Julius. So Rennie runs into Sean and they reunite with the teachers. They meet an an Irish police officer. He's very Irish. (laughs) Yes. Uh, And so he's trying to help them. But Jason grabs the police officer and they jump into the car and Julius's head is on the dashboard and the police officer gets killed. Rennie jumps into the driver's seat and takes off and she runs over Jason and then turns a corner down this dark alley and happens to see young child Jason standing in the middle of the street and it distracts her and she crashes into the wall. They get out of the car and it fucking explodes. <laughs> Well, and I just thought it was so. Yeah, and I just thought it was so funny how like they all make sure that the rest of them get out of the car and leave the other woman in there. It's like you guys grab her. Mrs. Van Dusen is still in the car and she dies. They don't. There's no establishing shot that she's still in the car. McCulloch says something like Van Dusen, and that's it. So if you a didn't know her her name, watching this movie, you have no idea why the hell like what he says. They don't show her. Like, even a shot of her trapped, like, looking out the window would have been helpful. Yeah. Right? Anyway, they have... Like, maybe literally... her seatbelt stuck, or maybe yeah. she can't get the door open. Right. I don't know. <laughs> no one has a reaction to this moment at all. Not even Rennie, and she's, like, 
her and Mrs. Van Dusen have a good relationship. It, yes. it, it, or so it seems. Like it Now, seems in like... this moment, Rennie looks down and there's a puddle that's on fire. And inside this puddle, she has a flashback. And it's it uh, it looks like a boat is in the middle of this puddle. A little tiny, you know, two person boat is in the middle of this puddle. And we flash back to Camp Crystal Lake when she was a little kid. She's on the boat with her uncle, Mr. McCulloch. He's telling her it's time that you learn how to swim. I brought you here three summers in a row. Every summer you say, I'm going to learn next year. You have to learn how to swim. And I think today is your first swimming lesson. And if you don't learn how to swim, that Voorhees boy is going to drown you. And then he fucking pushes her in the water. Yeah. It, I mean, this is a, a, a tactic of fight or flight, I guess. <laughs> like she has to learn how to swim or she'll drown. Um, listen, I'm not fond of children. I'm also just not an advocate of throwing them in the fucking yeah. ha- haunted lake if they don't know how to swim. <laughs> so as a little girl, she's fighting to learn how to swim and she looks underwater and little baby, little boy Jason is grabbing her feet and pulling her under the water. Which we come back. Understandable why she's traumatized because that would traumatize me too. Yeah, it's too much. And then you find uh, out that he's just always been an asshole. So yes, exactly. <laughs> an, a, an abusive guardian. Yep. So... We come back to present day. She says, you threw me in the water. It's like she's just remembering this for the first. Now she knows why she has aquaphobia. Now she knows why she keeps seeing young Jason. And maybe why Jason is after her. Maybe. I don't know. I don't buy it. Well, I mean, he does seem hell bent on like killing them, which I thought is really kind of funny in this movie. Like when he's chasing them all through New York, like he doesn't even care about the other people. He's just like those two. (laughs) Right. Yeah, he yeah. Jason could have uh, it could have been a smorgasbord, a buffet line of victims. Could have massacred all those people in that subway, yep. but that would have been kind of cool. So she, you know, tells McCulloch, "You pushed me in," and he says, "I pulled you out." And she says, "Yeah, but you pushed me in. You're the reason I'm afraid of water. Fuck you." In this moment, Jason appears and grabs McCulloch and shoves him into that barrel of green sludge that we saw during the opening credits. What I noticed is in the credits, the the rat is like alive and swimming. Yeah. Now the rat is dead and floating in the sludge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Super sad. Anyway, head first, he gets plunged down into this barrel of green sludge and is drowned. It's pretty gross. It's pretty gnarly. But it's also pretty satisfying because you've hated this character from the very beginning. So you're like, yes, finally, a, he gets what he deserves. Such an asshole. Yeah. So McCulloch has been killed. Jason chases Rennie and Sean uh, into a subway. So they go down that subway escalator that we saw in the opening shot and onto a train. They think they're going to get away. But they don't. Jason is in the car behind them looking through the window. So now they're running from car to car to car. I'm convinced that they had one subway car to film this on. And it's just them running through the same car over and over and over again. Probably. um, Also, this is clearly not an MTA. Like, no train <laughs> at all it's like decorate it's like red in color it just our trains never look like that I've when seen i just remember the 80s. yeah well and i just remember this like specific like weird sign next to the exit door that they exit out of it says help my daughter she needs blood or something it's like this oh really did weird... it yeah and then ne- on the poster it says uh jason lives really yeah it's written i think it's written in like graffiti sharpie or whatever somebody oh that's Jason cool lives on the poster that the only reason i remember that is i remember thinking that is a really weird poster to have a subway train it's like some woman with glasses and it's like please help my daughter she needs blood or something i was like the fuck that's kind of <laughs> hilarious though yeah uh so uh, what's f- a, a joke in this scene is that no one's reacting to jason the way that they should be this yeah. slimy wet six foot six hulk of a monster carrying a weapon no one has a reaction to it <laughs> he does run into a woman who falls down it's a pretty good stunt i gotta say uh and it then looks like Sean... he pushed her fucking hard too because yeah. Like, oh. yeah yeah hey, hey she says something she, her reaction <laughs> is weird yeah uh sean pulls a non-existent brake like they do not have <laughs> brakes accessible to passengers on subway trains no. but anyway it causes jason to fly backward on the train he gets back up they exit out the back of the train which is also not something that exists there's no back door that goes directly <laughs> to the subway track I feel like that'd be a safety issue so 
Yeah. So they exit. Jason exits behind them and Sean shoves him into the third rail. So it's like you see train track, train track and third rail up furthest away from you. It's coursing with electricity. It's actually a real thing. You don't touch the third rail or you get electrocuted. Yeah. And that's what happens to Jason. And they think it's over again. They exit up through Times Square. So I guess there used to be like a stairway that went directly up into the middle of Times Square. It's certainly not there anymore. Yeah. And we this is the only moment that they actually filmed in Manhattan. And we get this like 40 foot crane shot of circling around Times Square. And they're just looking at everything in awe. And I love looking at vintage Times Square and what this area that I live in like used to look like. Yeah. Especially compared to now where it's all video screens and it's all overwhelmingly. I mean, it was always like an advertisement capital with like billboards, but it's overwhelmingly commercial now. You like know, you can, it's like not even buildings anymore. It's just screens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I here's my thing. Times Square is a miserable place to go to during busy parts of the day. There's just tourists who aren't walking and people trying to get, you know, to like the fake Spider-Man trying to get you to take the picture with him and give him money. Um, <laughs> yeah. Times Square at like three in the morning is fucking amazing because there's nobody there. You have the whole place to yourself, but all of the lights are still going. Oh, it's really so cool. cool. Really cool in the middle of the night uh, when there's nobody else there. I'll have anyway, to come visit sometime and we'll have to go. That'd be fun. Yeah, I'll show you Times Square. It's it's pretty cool. I do. I will say in my day to day life, I will oftentimes walk around Times Square instead of walking through it if I have to get to the other side. Yeah, it's a stressful experience. All right. So they think it's over and then they turn around and they see Jason come up from the subway. So they run, run, run. <laughs> Jason has this is maybe my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> there are the punks that we saw at the beginning of the movie, one of them's got a mohawk, one of them's a skinhead, uh, smoking cigarettes and listening to music. They're listening to this terrible rap song. <laughs> God, yeah. uh, that's really about how hard it is to live in New York City and how perilous it is. It's not, it's clearly not a real song. Living in the city ain't no big deal. You gotta have a heart made of stainless steel. If the crack don't get you, then the hookers will. Living in the city ain't no big deal. And he kicks their stereo as he walks past them and they you know react and one of them says like hey slime ball we're gonna mess you up and he like pulls out a switchblade and does like a cool hand trick with his switchblade and so they're these four kids are like determined to kick jason's ass and he just turns around and he takes his hockey mask and he lifts it up you don't see his face but they see his face and they freak out and run away real real fast they're and, like, oh no, man, no trouble. Sorry. Yeah, it's a stupid gag that Kane Hodder actually does not like this joke. He thinks it's a cheap shot. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. He has said that this moment, filming in the middle of Times Square, was the coolest part of his career. Oh, I bet. Because uh, they had blocked off Times Square. You can see people standing behind barricades in the distance. It's kind of interesting. There's one shot where you can see fans of the movie uh, watching them film. He never took his mask off while they were filming this part. He didn't want to break the illusion yeah. of Jason being real to these people. And he stayed in character while he was walking around, even when they weren't actually filming. So if he would like creepily go and like, look at the people behind the barricades, everyone would start screaming. So uh, cool. He, Cause he felt like a rock star. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, Jason was a big deal back then. He, you know, he still is, yeah. but like also, you know what? Interesting enough. <laughs> there's this weird guy who, today like nowadays he's this massive jacked like buff bodybuilder dude who at nighttime will cover himself in oil and wear scary masks and just walk around times square blasting old music hmm. and sometimes he'll do a hockey mask sometimes it'll be a scary clown mask but i i he's just like this shirtless weirdly oiled up for no reason <laughs> guy who wears scary masks and walks around times square interesting um, I don't even think he's asking for money, but I run into him every once in a while because uh, whatever his route to get there is my front door. So I see him out my front door sometimes, too. Anyway, Rennie and Sean, our sole two survivors, run into a diner. and I, I love this scene, too. Me, too. We see a waitress put a cigarette out into a plate of, <laughs> of eggs, which is just so funny. I mean... People used to smoke in diners. Uh, I used to work with this older woman many years ago, and she said we would be like cooking on the line with a cigarette in our mouth back in the day. 
uh, which I think is hilarious. And so Rennie and Sean say, you have to help us. Somebody's kidding or somebody's trying to kill us. And she just looks at them very deadpan and goes, welcome to New York. <laughs> it's so rolls good. Her, rolls her eyes and walks away. It's so funny. This is just something that this is just every Tuesday for them. <laughs> yes, exactly. They try to get someone to help them. The phone in the back is broken. No one gives a fuck. And Jason walks in and starts being menacing. So this massive, huge guy, a line cook, steps out from behind the counter and approaches Jason like he's going to kick Jason's ass. This actor is played by Ken Kersinger, who would go on to play Jason in Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. What's interesting to me is that they didn't bring Kane Hodder back for Freddy vs. Jason because they said he was too big. And next to Robert England, who plays Freddy Krueger, it wouldn't look right. But this guy's actually, it looks like he's taller than Jason in this movie. I think so, yeah. Unless they had him on a platform. Anyway, Jason grabs this line cook and picks him up and throws him against the wall and presumably kills him. Sean and Rennie run through the back door of the diner, out the kitchen, into the uh, um, alley, and make their way down into the sewer system. (laughs) For whatever reason. I, they're running out of hiding places, obviously, <laughs> in this massive city. And uh, they come across uh, a sewage worker who's just down there. And he tells them, you can't be here uh, in in no time at all. This whole sewer system is going to flood with toxic waste. It does it every night at midnight. That is not how sewers work. I was going to say, I was like, that's not a thing. But okay. No, New York City is not dumping toxic <laughs> waste into the river every night right at the stroke of midnight that's ridiculous (laughs) they just needed a plot device they're just like making shit up at this point so of course jason appears and kills the worker and sean gets knocked unconscious rennie grabs a vat of toxic waste and throws it into jason's face and he it, it he takes his mask off and we see jason's face and it looks so stupid it's just not a good design. No. I do think it's cool that in every movie, his face looks different. Like they just kind of start all over and pick a yeah. new design. It looked so good in part seven with like the weird gnarly teeth. Cause that moment where Tina uses her mind to like rip his mask off. Yeah. That reveal is great. He looks so gross and scary in this one. I think they're going for like a waterlogged look. Cause he's stark white. Yeah. Um, with like one giant eyeball and really stupid looking teeth. I, I think they are looking for like waterlogged, but you know, cause the rest of his skin that's showing is not as white as what was behind the mask. So. And his mouth almost kind of looks like, like a rotted, like a rotting, like jack-o'-lantern in a sense. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. It looks really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. He makes like this noise. Like it almost sounds like an elephant screaming. He's like, Whoa! yeah. <laughs> and stumbles around. Rennie starts getting away. She wakes Sean up and they start to climb a ladder hoping to escape. And there's a grate above them and he's pushing against the grate, but it won't open up to the street to get out. So they're trapped on this ladder up at the top of it. Can't get out the grate. Jason grabs Rennie by the feet and starts to try to pull her down. As this is happening, the light bulbs are swinging. Yeah. Like the water's coming. Uh, And then it comes and it just looks like water. It does not look like toxic waste. Uh, no. Jason, I don't know. They must have filmed this part in like a, this might be maybe the part that was in LA where they filmed. Uh, Cause this is obviously like a tank. Yeah. They can fill with water. Anyway, Jason gets trapped in this sludge uh, in this toxic waste. I mean, and uh, he's taken under. And oh, right before it hits, he mouths like the voice of young Jason comes out of Jason's mouth and he says, mommy, mommy, don't let me drown. And then he throws up water right when this toxic waste hits him. Now, Kane Hodder says that he threw up himself on cue. He drank a fuck ton of water, like just chugged it all right before they hit, like right before they started recording. Oh, and uh, so he says that that's actually him throwing up. I call bullshit because it really looks like it's coming through a pump. (laughs) Maybe he lied about a bunch of shit in this movie. Listen, I mean, I'm not going to call Kane Hodder a liar. I wasn't there. It just doesn't look like it's coming out of his mouth. It really looks like there's a pump behind whatever makeup he's wearing. Yeah. Whatever. I'm not going to fight with Kane Hodder because he's going to kick my ass. (laughs) 
<laughs> the water overtakes him. His mask has fallen off. And as the water starts to recede, Sean and Rennie see little young Jason laying down in the sewer where the water was and not moving. And we see Jason's mask float away in the, sl- in the toxic waste. I don't know how they get out of the sewer, but they do. <laughs> yeah. And they find themselves in Times Square again. And they say, it's finally over. And Sean takes, he gives her the Statue of Liberty necklace uh, from before and says, there's a 22 foot or a 22 story statue somewhere in this city. I'd love to take you to see it. And then they start to walk away. We see a first person view of someone creeping up on them from behind and they turn around and it's Toby, the dog, the dog survived. The dog is alive. Woo. The dog found them in this big, massive Island. Mm -hmm. The dog was able to find them. Thank God. And the three of them live happily ever after. And the credits begin to roll into overtime square. And we hear that song again. (laughs) The darkest side of the night. The darkest side of the night. Uh, playing over the credits, oh, and that is Jason. Friday the Thirteenth, Part Eight. Jason takes Manhattan. That was fun. Oh God, I I <laughs> I don't know. I can't help it. I like this movie. It's not like I will say, like of all like of all the Friday the Thirteenth movies, I I find this one pretty entertaining for the most part. Like I feel like it has like out of all the films, I feel like it has like the most colorful cast of characters. Yeah. I feel like everyone's like distinctly different for the most part, like whether it's like the way they're dressed or their characters in general, like this one is fun. I don't know why people hate it so much. And like I said, it's probably just because it was poorly mismarketed and people probably thought they were going to see a movie where he's like in Manhattan the whole time. So I can understand why people don't like it for that aspect, but it's definitely not the worst Friday the 13th movie I've ever seen. Agreed. It does something different. I mean, listen, I also love Jason X. So I think it's very clear that I am not, (laughs) a big Friday the 13th fan. If I love what are commonly called the worst two movies in the series. Uh, They're also the two that don't take place at Camp Crystal Lake. So that says something as well. (laughs) You just like, you like diversity and that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. um, The thing about Jason is that they, they don't take him as seriously. Like, so Michael Myers, who was it? I think it was Robert England. No, it, you know what? It was, um, I think it was Clive Barker who said uh, after Freddy versus Jason came out and was a hit, they wanted to do Michael versus Pinhead and they couldn't get, um, they couldn't get Mustafa Akkad and Malik Akkad who owned the rights to Michael to agree to it because it came off as silly to them. And Clive Barker said something to the effect of the, the Akkads treat Michael Myers as though he's Hamlet. And that's kind of true. They really try yeah. to take his storyline seriously even though it's ridiculous and becomes laughable they're they're approaching it from a this is a very serious story point of view whereas freddy obviously has fun with it he's allowed to it's a dream world right it can be over the top and silly and then friday the yeah. 13th the series just knows what it is and they're not trying to be anything more than you know hokey a, and cheesy hokey and... fun slasher yeah. yeah it works for me in this one uh, all right. Well, on the Rick Treat Horror Cast, we have a rating system. A movie is either a trick, which means it's okay, a treat, which means you loved it, or it is a smell my feet, which means it sucks. <laughs> Michael, how would you rate this movie? I'm I'm gonna give it a trick, cause okay. cause I don't love it, but there are things that I do like about it. Like, and as I said before. I hadn't seen this movie in years. I know I've seen it before, but it had been so long since I uh, saw it last. And I, I enjoyed it. Like it, it wasn't hard to sit through. Like I, I remember when we first talked about doing this episode, I was like, Oh, I'm not the biggest Friday the 13th fan. So I wasn't like super excited at first to, to watch a Friday movie. Cause it's been so long since I've watched any of them. So I was like, Oh, um, and then I, I sat down and watched it and I was like, it was actually kind of fun. And it, it has it has some fun characters. I mean, unfortunately, the main character, like the the main protagonist, the final girl, I guess, as you could say, we have to follow her throughout the movie and she's not 
the most fun to be around. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give it a trick. There's some good sequences in this movie. There's some good kills. Uh, the characters are fun. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a trick. I'm going to give it a trick as well. Uh, I do enjoy it every once in a while. I've seen it multiple, multiple times. Uh, if I'm going to watch a Friday movie, it's oftentimes the one that I'll, it's my go-to. And that's it. Trick, trick, trick all the way. Well, Michael, I'm so happy that you were on my show. I can't wait to have you back. I hope you'll come back. Of course I will. And I hope you'll come on mine too. I really want I you to come wait. on mine because this was yeah. so fun. Good. Yeah, I agree. Well, listen, where can my listeners stalk you? Um, so you can find me at the We Love Horror Podcast. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm streaming anywhere you stream your podcasts. Uh, I do have TikTok at the We Love Horror Podcast as well. Um, as we stated at the beginning of the episode, I have a brand new YouTube channel, which is anything and everything horror. If you search that up, you should be able to find me. And um, I also have a Patreon and merch. So all in my Instagram bio. So yeah, follow me on there. So cool. You've got it all going on. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, listeners. And join me next week when I have the guys from the Horror Daddies podcast, John and Carlos on. We're going to talk about The Lost Boys. And I'll see y'all later, Spookies. Thanks for coming Rick or Treating. You can follow the show on Instagram at Rick or Treat Pod. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Satsanz's Danse Macabre with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. Links to the artist's music can be found in the episode description. Check him out, he's frighteningly talented. Rick or Treat Horrorcast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick or Treat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>